think if anything, I was kind of hoping that uh, uh, I would have the dog equivalent of a Garfield, because Garfield uh, mm-hmm. was and still is pretty huge, but was at the time when I was uh, devising a strip. And I didn't think there was a dog that was on that, that level of iconic, uh, uh, oops, uh, of iconic love uh, from uh, comic strip users, uh, readers. But um, that didn't quite go that, <laughs> that way. Poncho is more of a, uh, uh, you kindly call it a cult following. Um, but it's, uh, that was on my mind. I- Welcome back, everyone, to the Comics Cube. Today, I am with Paul Gilligan, the cartoonist behind Pooch Cafe. Hi, Paul. Hi, Louis. Thanks for inviting me on your show. It's great. I'm a big fan of your of your comic. I subscribe to oh. it every day. I, that's fantastic. I appreciate it. You're uh, you're already one of my best friends, then. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm loving the current storyline with uh, with uh, Carmen trying to prove that. She belongs in the crazy cat lady society. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, the trick was that she, uh, she found it insulting until the, until they barred her entrance because she uh, cohabitated with the dog. <laughs> just a blow to her <laughs> ego. Uh, for people who don't know what Pooch Cafe is, would you mind giving us your elevator pitch? Uh, it's about um, a dog uh, who lives with his master and was perfectly happy until one day they moved into uh, a house with a crazy cat lady and uh, and her cats, kind of like a a Brady Bunch thing, except uh, with cats along both sides and a a dog in the middle. And uh, he deals with this by um, finding help at a local hangout called the Pooch Cafe, where dogs uh, talk about dog problems, such as uh, the embarrassment of toilet breath and um, how to deal with mailmen. And they also have these secret meetings on how to uh, remove cats from the world who they consider a fuzzy virus. That's pretty and, much it. And uh, the, the dog is named Poncho and he is a, he is a ball of fire. <laughs> a ball of fire. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I got this, uh, this notion that uh, like dogs in comics uh, are always kind of portrayed as uh you know, loyal and uh, courageous and dependable. And some dogs probably are like that, but I've lived with dogs and um, sometimes they're, you know, uh, greedy and self-serving and opportunistic. And I hadn't really seen a dog that was uh, displayed that way in comics, at least at the time. And uh, I was kind of thought it's more fun to, to write for flawed characters than uh, lofty ones. So um, that's kind of how it got started. He's kind of scary too. Like everyone is afraid of him. No, no dog walker wants to walk him. No, <laughs> the mailmen don't want to come near him. Yeah, I think that's probably a product of the fact that I've been doing it for 20 years because, uh, you know, you, you start off a little bit small, but then uh, you need somewhere no, new to go as it goes along. So uh, it's gotten more extreme in, uh, in his um, ways of doing things. And I guess <laughs> as a result, he's got a reputation as a pretty scary guy. You mentioned uh, you mentioned a specific comic strip before we started the show, and I just realized the comic strip you mentioned the main character is also a massive troublemaker. No babysitter wants to be near him. Uh, no teacher wants to be near him. Safe to say you were also influenced by Calvin and Hobbes. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, every uh, everyone who gets interviewed uh, always says no, the big three. They're, everyone's influenced by uh, Bloom County and Calvin and Hobbes and Peanuts, and The Far Side, I guess, maybe the big four. Those, uh, you know, I don't think you could really be doing a comic today and not say that uh, that those guys influenced you, because even if they didn't influence you directly, they influenced everybody else who works in comics. So the trickle-down effect is that, yeah, we're all we're all influenced by those guys, and, and Calvin and Hobbes especially, because he's, uh, I really like the long format storytelling that, uh, the Watterson did where you could have a story that went on for weeks and a lot of the humor came from the interplay between the two characters uh, and uh, as opposed to setups and, and, and punchlines. And basically what, what sparked the idea for Pooch Cafe, if you can remember that far back? Yeah, yeah, let me dig back into the old memory bank there. Um, 
I think it, uh, well, it started off um, when uh, I want to do a comic. I, the first thing I did, uh, I, it was this strange guy with a rutabaga shaped head uh, that didn't really have much of a, of a premise. And uh, so it was kind of strange. And I got some responses from the syndicate saying that they liked the work, but they couldn't sell it because it didn't have any identifiability. So, um, so I sat down and thought, okay, what can I, what do I have in my life that I can use as something that's identifiable to others? And I didn't have a, any kids or family. I didn't work in an office. Uh, I tried to strip about uh, a female lawyer because I guess I was watching Ally McBeal at the time, but that was misguided because I'm not female and I didn't know anything about law. Um, so I thought, uh, yeah, what do I, what do I have in my life that I can use that other people might uh, connect with? And I lived, I lived with a dog and I lived with dogs all my life. And uh, so, yeah, it kind of came about uh, in practical terms. It's just something that I could use as a, a hook that other um, uh, people that read comics could uh, connect with. I noticed, uh, so aside from, aside from Bill Watterson, who else influenced your style? It doesn't have to be from comics, your art style or your sense of humor. Yeah, that's uh, interesting to say, like not from, from comics, and I assume by that you mean comic strips. Um, obviously, I read like a lot of comics when I was a kid, but I went through about a 10-year period from 10 to 20 where all I wanted to look at were Marvel comics. And... Um, and then after that, I kind of got into alternative comics. So I was reading things like Peter Bag and Chester Brown. And I think that's why you might see in Pooch Cafe a lot of surreal stuff or uh, characters in intense arguments with each other. Because that's very Peter Bag-esque. And also my, you might see a lot of uh, references to Galactus and, and MODOK and things like, like that <laughs> out of nowhere because uh, I never successfully got to draw any Marvel comics, but I now get to uh, put some of them in my comic strip. Yeah, it's pretty obvious you're a big Marvel fan. Like off the top of my head, aside from Galactus and MODOK, I remember Dr. Octopus. Uh, you had Poncho going around in a Dr. Octopus. <laughs> yeah, wherever possible, I, uh, yeah, I slide some of my, uh, my favorite Marvel characters in there. And uh, you talked about the surrealism. Like, I'm not a creative person. I don't know how that works. How, like, but I find it really funny. How are you sure it's funny? Like, you had this one strip that I that I've always remembered, where uh, where Carmen is is chasing Poncho across the street, and she's like, "Don't worry, I'm gonna catch you," because he's running away from something. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, they they run through a sauna full of guys, and then she was like, "What in the hell was that?" <laughs> right yeah yeah i don't know um, how do i know it's funny there's no way of knowing you kind of um, make yourself laugh and you put it out there and um often you never even hear anything i can uh, you know go and read message boards or anything like that so uh i don't know if it landed or not people thought it was funny or if they uh, just thought it was weird but at least if it's something new and unexpected then um you know it they get points for that. Um, but yeah, like, like the, like I was kind of saying before, you just kind of always need new places to go. Otherwise, you know, um, no disrespect to, to strips like, uh, say Blondie where, you know, he's, um, making the same sandwich and running into the same mailman, um, on a regular basis. Uh, I just kind of like, uh, you know, always trying to do something that I hadn't, that I hadn't seen before in the comics. So, you're kind of almost left with <laughs> surrealism as a, as a default then. That's, uh, yeah, so the, the thing with that is you're talking about how you're not sure if it lands. Uh, how do you measure uh, success in, in this field? Because, you know, the comic book fans, you know, there's a lot of forums about them, then they get in the heated debates and people fight and everything. Uh, comic strips, with a cup with a few exceptions not so much and i've always kind of found that weird because you know if you look at if you look at the go comics uh, likes and engagements and everything they're pretty high mm -hmm. but i'm always wondering in their comments and everything but i'm always wondering why there doesn't seem to be that dedicate like you know that kind of dedicated fandom 
or at least the kind of dedicated fandom that would get into arguments and feel strongly about this stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. I wonder if that happened um, like you know, like forty years ago when comics were more of a, a household um, understanding. Like every everyone knew. I, I find it always like interesting to 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 think that when I was a kid, everybody knew. Hey, are the horrible and high and Lois and Charlie Brown, like it didn't matter if you were a quote fan or not, everyone just knew. And, uh, but nowadays, if I talk to anybody, um, I can say, you know, what the most famous comics were the last 20 years. And a lot of them still don't know them, right? So, uh, so maybe it's just uh, that uh, lack of uh, connection that, you know, cause, cause movies, like everybody knows, um, the big movies, so everyone's got an opinion on them. But, you know, um, anyway, I guess to kind of go back to your question, like, yeah, it's true that like, people just don't argue about them as much. Maybe there's just not as much at stake. Like, it's not really, it doesn't really matter if I do a comic where um, I had it, that Poncho, you know, um, learned a certain lesson and then a month later he's never heard of that thing again, right? People are going to call it out and go like, hey, that's a flaw in the logic of the strip. Like, I guess, you know, you know comics uh, writers ask people to um, adhere to that, that level of uh, dependability on, on the logic of the strip. So maybe that's why it's like kind of pointless to argue over it if <laughs> the creators themselves don't ask you to uh, adhere to any um, specifics and logics. It's 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 strange to me because I've always kind of felt like comic strips probably had a wider reach, right? Because you know there are newspapers and everything, and it's also easier for you guys to go viral, um, even because it's just one one strip. But anyway, um, I did a I did a, a series um, about I don't know maybe it's about six seven years ago now, and. Uh, I call it a series, but what it, what it did is I went back to, because I was kind of just trying to come up with new, interesting ways to uh, to, to do Pooch Cafe. And um, I decided I would go back to when Poncho was just born. It was like flash, not flashback, it was supposed to be like a real, real thing that happened. And I did it for like a year. I started off when he was like still in utero and he was born with his, uh, his like litter mates and just like learning how to see and then, you know, be a puppy and stuff like that. And then how and he was very small and how he got uh, adopted by, by Chaz. And uh, I thought, well, you know, at the very least, this should make some waves. I don't know if people are gonna like it or not. I didn't really hear anything. <laughs> I didn't really like, you know, I thought, man, if, if people are gonna go discuss that, then, then uh, they're just not, vested in discussing it, which might be fine. I don't know, maybe they're not gonna come down hard on me for things either for that reason. But uh, yeah, just to show as an example of like how extreme you can be and still, uh, at least with my strip, I don't know, maybe if, uh, if uh, for better or for worse did something as, as extreme, <laughs> it'd be a lot more uh, chatter on the boards. But, um, but yeah, it didn't happen with Pooch Cafe. Well, for better or for worse, you know, is dealing with controversial topics at a time when they weren't ready, I think. So. Right, right. right. I remember one of the characters came out as gay in, in that strip, and that, that caused a lot of chatter. So I guess it's still possible <laughs> if you uh, <laughs> right now. Plus, you know, who's going to fight a Canadian? <laughs> yeah. We'll just say sorry and you know, take the wind out of your sails. <laughs> yeah, no one wants to fight Canadians. Um, we'll just feel like we'll just feel like jerks. Our, so I have a question. Um, this is something that I have that I've only ever seen a couple of other cartoonists do. The way that you kind of transpose the animal behavior onto an anthropomorphized character. Like when, when Chaz takes Poncho for a walk, Poncho's walking on two legs. Like he may as well not have the leash, but you still have the leash, right? Or um, when, when, Poncho's, when Poncho goes to the cafe, he, he, takes, he takes deodorant and then he sprays it on his ass. So, 
uh, like, how do you come up with that stuff? Because to be frank, the only other person that I've ever seen who's been able to do that is Carl Barks. Right. Like, right. Just be able to take the animal stuff and transpose it and still make it work. The idea that I have in my strip is that uh, dogs think of themselves as people. So it's from the dog's perspective. So in the dog's world, they act just like the human beings. And that's also why the cats in the, in the, in the Pooch Cafe world um, don't have personalities because in a dog's mind, they're not equals. They're, they're still down here. They're just like cats and they don't talk. They all look the same. Um, so that's why, you know, Poncho will walk around. He can open doors. He can use things because he thinks of, some, of himself as, as a human. But of course, because he is still a dog, you know, when, and whenever it's funny, he then can't, right? Like, you know, he could have a cell phone, but he can't operate a can opener because, you know, that, because it's just yes. better for the joke, right? That he can't do everything that he wants to do. You know, he's still, uh, he still has the impulses of a dog. He can't help but um, chase a ball. And when he wants to drink, he drinks from the toilet. Uh, but he still walks and talks like a human. So it's, in a way, it's kind of like he's a human being uh, in a dog suit. And he has no choice but to follow certain dog rules. But he's otherwise an actual person. So it's funny that you mentioned how the cats don't have individual characters because he, that's how he sees them. Uh, but fish is able to talk. So does that mean that he sees fish as an ally, as a... That's a good question. Yeah, it is a flaw in the, uh, in the, the premise that I just, just said. But I mean, that was again, born out of necessity. Like I needed him to have an ally in the house. Couldn't have another dog because that's, that's too much of an ally. So he needed a sounding board. So, um, so I just have it so that that fish and, and Poncho can, can talk but cats still, still can't. Part of the reason I came up with that too is I didn't want to turn into a, um, a cats versus dogs strip because that kind of thing has been done in various media many times. So uh, in order to steer away from that, I, um, I made sure that the cats didn't become full on adversaries where they would, were then coming up with counter schemes and having arguments because uh, then that's what it would be all about, right? So. Um, so that's why that's why the I I came up with that game plan and uh, yeah you know you're, you're right to point out that it just doesn't really fit it but uh, you know you, you need them for the jokes. Um, are the characters based on real people? <laughs> um, not really. Nothing. Nothing specific. I guess every artist is probably cobbling together bits of people that they know whether consciously or not. But um, you know, the, only, the only connection to reality, I would say, is that uh, sometimes when Poncho's ranting about something, some of my friends who know me say they totally hear my voice coming out of his mouth. Because uh, I guess I do like a good rant sometimes. Um, so I'm, I, I got to ask, are they Canadian? <laughs> not on purpose but i do put canadianisms in there again by by accident i'll i'll use the word toque instead of cap and my editor will be like what's a toque <laughs> or another one is uh i'll say i'll say going up north for the weekend because that's an expression if you live in canada and you go up north for the weekend that's usually where the the cities uh become more um, spread out and there's cottages and such but um say saying uh, going up north to someone who lives in california <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. That's funny because one of my closest friends uh, lives in Canada now, uh, and I used to live in the U.S. And one time he came to visit me, and when I was living in the U.S., and he kept on calling his hat a toque, and I was right. like, "What's a toque?" And like eventually, I was like, "What? What do you, why do you keep saying that word? It's not a word." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's things if you're in Canada and you like live with something all your life, you just assume everybody knows that thing, but. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I learned, I learned a few things from my editor so every once in a while I'll put in a word and, uh, it gets mixed. I asked if the characters are based on real people because, uh, most comic strips, uh, the, the main characters or something tend to be based on real people. Like, uh, you know, uh, Dana Simpson was on the show and she was basically saying how, uh, Phoebe from Phoebe and her unicorn is kind of like how she was as a, 
as a kid, uh, Stefan Pastis literally has himself in his strip. Uh, yeah, that one's easy to grab. Uh, I think I've heard that Charles Schultz has said Charlie Brown is, is him when he was young. Yeah. Um, so my next question is, uh, I've read, well, actually, I've got another question that I just thought of now. Uh, so you came up with a strip 20 years ago, and with the advent of social media, you've seen how much people love dogs and cats. Do you feel you were ahead of the curve? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I think everyone's always loved dogs and cats. I think, if anything, I was kind of hoping that uh, uh, I would have the dog equivalent of a Garfield, because Garfield... Uh, Mm -hmm. was and still is pretty huge but was at the time when I was uh, devising a strip and I didn't think there was a dog that was on that that level of iconic uh, uh, oops of, of iconic love from, uh, from uh, comic strip users uh, readers but um, that didn't quite go that, <laughs> that way Poncho's more of a uh, uh, you kindly call a cult following um, but it's uh, that was on my mind. I think I was trying to like say, uh, you know, could I come up with something? I mean, people love dogs, but could I come up with something that was going to be like the dog guy? Um, and uh, no, I was not really ahead of any curves, I don't think. Do you feel that, um, that you know, he would be not a cult favorite, but an actual favorite if I read that it was a movie uh, that was being talked about, if that had pushed through? Uh, and if you want to tell us what happened there, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, what happened was uh, when we worked on it with Sony Animation for about four years, and uh, you know it was going pretty good. They we had a really great producer attached, and uh, I wrote about ten drafts of the script, and, and finally we had a draft that everybody was really happy with. Um, but part of the problem was that uh, it's just just a small number of people that can direct full length animated features that um, have experience doing it. So they were trying to find somebody that, uh, that could do it and they were having, having trouble landing somebody that they wanted to do the job. And then uh, as what often happens in, in Hollywood um, things, whenever there's a changing of the guard, uh, they often are not as uh, apt to take on existing projects. So, um, so that happened and then uh, they, they didn't renew the option, uh, but it could have still got picked up by somebody else or they could have come back to it at a later date. But then uh, The Secret Life of Pets came out and that was considered to be very similar territory to Pooch Cafe. So now when people, it's still being shopped around by, uh, by my agent, um, but that's kind of often the response in terms of it ever being like a feature length CGI movie. Uh, there's been some talk about trying it maybe like a uh, semi-live action, like Marmaduke. Um, and, uh, but we do have some interest in maybe turning it into a TV show. There's been, it's been an option again for that. Um, so it's not over yet. We may still see Poncho on uh, some type of screen. Pause crossed. That'd be great. Uh, you, did, you did have him on, uh, was it called Ringside? No. Um... Uh, you did have oh, some Ringtails, Ringtails. Ringtails yeah, yeah. Like, oh, quite a while ago. Yeah, they did little 30 second uh, animated versions of some of the strips. That was fun. Yeah, so I mean, he seems like he seems perfect for a for a short animated uh, series, kind of like kind of like the Wee Bear Bears. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 The, the tone yeah, I mean, kind of similar. Uh, I think uh, like what it has different than say something like the Secret like. Of pets because it's not just about um, what dogs are really doing when uh, humans aren't around. It's kind of more, like I said earlier, like the Brady Bunch. It's really about blended families and uh, making that work. So, um, you know, if you're going with that angle, um, maybe a small screen's better for a story like that than uh, a big, a big budget, like lots of like action kind of, kind of CGI thing on a, on a big screen. So, no, we're hoping. I mean, I got, I've, I've done a lot of work on the stories for that, the, the pitching, and um, I, I see that it, it could work. So, you know, hopefully they do as well. 
Do you have a particular storyline that you were going to use for the movie? Is that from from the from the comics, or was that up in the air? Yeah, just the, well, it's kind of the basic storyline of trying to get um, Poncho to accept living with. Like, the, I guess it's from from Chad's perspective. It's his best friend, and it's his new love of his life, and bringing them together, and uh, they don't get along. So, um, you know, Poncho obviously will go to extreme lengths to try and just remove her from from the house. So they built a giant catapult to try and catapult all all Earth's cats into the sun. And uh, uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of the gist of it. We had a lot of drafts, so I can't even remember, you know, in, in various drafts, uh, there was villains that uh, came in and out. Um, but yeah, the, the story is, is about them coming to terms with each other yeah, in the end. And what one thing you can do in a, in a movie that you can't do in a comic strip is that they can learn and grow and um, become okay with each other. Whereas in the comic, it kind of always has to reset to uh, to a point where they still don't like each other. In your mind, uh, if you know, in your mind, who would be the perfect voice for Poncho? Uh, yeah, that question's come up a lot, but I don't, I don't know how have an answer for that. Somebody at one point said somebody like Dustin Hoffman, and um, that would have been like twenty years ago. But I like, oh yeah, I kind of like that, like kind of deeper kind of. Uh, uh, sort of smart sounding um, voice, but it has to be somebody who, uh, when they get angry, they're funny. So, um, cause Poncho gets angry a lot, but when he's, when he's yelling, it can't actually be like jarring. It has to be like, you laugh at him when he's, when he's yelling. So maybe Will Ferrell or somebody could do something like that. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, so I love your strip, uh, but is there anything else you're working on or? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, about a year ago, I wrote a, an early chapter book for kids, uh, 8 to 12 years old, and it's called King of the Mole People. It's about um, this kid who uh, gets made king of an underground race of mole men against his will. They force him to be their king, and all he wants to do is fit in at school. Um, but uh, there's a, like a hole in his backyard that leads to this uh, underground realm, and um, the mole people are just kind of the first level and it just kind of keeps going down. There's slug people and mushroom folk and stone goons. So there's a lot of politics and uh, um, it kind of reflects his life in school where there's a lot of uh, cliques. And, uh, and then I'll show you the, the cover over here in case uh, anybody wants to see. That's uh, King of the Mole People. And then uh, just about a week ago, I... Uh, I've had the sequel come out. This one's oh, called cool. Rise of the Slugs. And um, it's available um, at Amazon or any other online sellers. And it uh, just kind of continues Doug's adventures. And um, there's also been an option uh, for that that's uh, in the works for a TV show, which doesn't mean it's going to come out yet, but it means that uh, some other people found it funny. And uh, hopefully, uh, maybe one day that'll be on the screen. And so, anyway. uh, yeah. Yeah, to, uh, just I'm just going to say to anybody watching this, uh, there will be links to those books uh, at the bottom of the video. So, oh, thanks, Dewey. Yeah, uh, you were cool. saying before I rudely interrupted. Oh, yeah, no, I was just saying, uh, yeah, anybody who uh, has kids that like uh, funny stories, um, or if they just like talking slugs, um, maybe there's a couple books they might want to check out. It seems to me that there's a natural transition uh, or a crossover between comic strip artists and uh, children's books. It's happened, yeah, in the last, uh, you know, like five, ten years. A lot of my peers have had uh, books come out. I think it all came from the Diary of a Wimpy Kid phenomenon, however many years ago that was, because uh, he also um, was into comic strips. And uh, it kind of opened up this genre of uh, book that was heavily illustrated and funny. And um, so that uh, opened the doors, so I think, for a lot of comic strip artists to uh, try doing books and uh, the publishing world was very open to that. So yeah, quite a few of my peers also have, have, have similar style of books. That's interesting. He has the best selling comic book out right now. Like according to, uh, I think book scan, uh, dog man. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Dog man. That's uh, yeah. It's I read, I read it to my kids and it's hilarious. <laughs> He's really got something. That's uh, Captain. <laughs> they, 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 
Yeah. Uh, I've got a friend who works in a library uh, and she says she ordered 10, uh, 20 copies of Dogman and they all fly off the shelves. Like every time it comes back, another kid will check it out. So, right. Right. Um, so this has been great. This is awesome. I love your strip. It's really funny. Everybody should check it out on Go Comics. Uh, and I'll put up a link to that as well. Is there anything else you want to say? Or I uh, know. Just uh, thank you so much for having me on your show. It's been a real pleasure. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Dewey. Take care. Thank you.